China, 2015. A thriving, bustling nation of almost 1.4 billion souls. It is the most populous nation on Earth. It is an industrial and commercial powerhouse, the strength of which is central to the health of the global economy. It is suggested that China has recently overtaken the United States as the world's largest economy. Its military power is formidable, with a standing army of almost 2.5 million, and is second only to the United States in terms of military spending. For many in China, life is good. Its middle class is growing in multiples, and its spending power is immense. For a few, life is very good indeed. Especially its 250 billionaires, many of whom are investing in businesses and property all over the world. This is the bird's nest in Beijing, China's Olympic Stadium, where in 2008 it paraded itself to the world as the new global superpower. It was Napoleon who said, let China sleep, for when she awakes, the world will tremble. How right he was. But a generation ago, it was very different. China was still locked in an era of self-imposed darkness, where the people had just lived through years of violent turmoil appalling terror and mass starvation. A generation before that was a period of incessant war, first against brutal Japanese invaders, then in a vicious civil war where Chinese fought Chinese for the future of their nation. Throughout these last 70 years, one towering presence has been at the heart of all these dramatic changes. He led the Chinese Communist Party to victory in both wars. He then led his people in a unique attempt at creating a communist utopia, ruling them with an iron fist. Now, even though he's been dead for 40 years, his name is still writ large in Chinese consciousness. His memory is so potent, he is still spoken about in hushed tones. A man of bizarre personal habits and self-indulgent excesses, he has been called many things. Visionary leader, father of his people, vicious dictator. But there is no denying his position as one of the most significant people of modern times. Using newly discovered archive, almost all of it never seen before, and the letters and diaries of those who lived through his reign, a reign of terror and agonizing rebirth. This is his story told for the first time in authentic and fully restored color film.
Moscow, August 12th, 1945. A parade to celebrate the triumph of Allied forces against Nazi Germany. The Second World War is all but over. Three days earlier, the United States had dropped a second atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki, Japan, Germany's ally in Asia. Its imperial dream over, the Japanese are on the verge of surrender. On the same day, just after midnight on August 9th, a huge Soviet Red Army, over a million and a half men, invaded northern China. Japanese occupiers began to surrender to Soviet forces in vast numbers. As US General Dwight Eisenhower and Ambassador to Moscow, Avril Harriman, celebrate victory with their Soviet allies, leader Joseph Stalin and General Georgi Zhukov, their allies in China, are denied any form of celebration. The defeat of Japan in China does not bring peace, but rather the outbreak of a catastrophic civil war. China is bitterly divided between the nationalist armies of the Kuomintang and its leader Chiang Kai-shek and the communist forces of the People's Liberation Army under revolutionary leader Mao Zedong. There has been a truce of sorts between Mao and Chiang during the Japanese occupation of China when both sides fought against the invaders. But with Japan's defeat, civil war is inevitable. This 1930s nationalist propaganda poster shows the devil of communism being slayed by a traditional Chinese hero. Conversely, this communist poster urges China's peasants, workers and soldiers to resist the nationalists and their murderous supporters, Western imperialists and China's old aristocratic warlords. Mao, already an iconic leader among the Chinese peasantry, has been waging war since the early 1930s. This poster, based on a painting of him from 1935, when he was 42 years old, is the earliest known image of Mao in color. It shows him in Yan'an, in the central heart of China, to where, with only a few loyal followers, he escaped from encircling nationalist forces in what became enshrined as Mao's legendary Long March. The heroics of the Long March consolidated Mao's position as the leader of China's Communist Party. But some historians claim that many of the events never happened and that Mao himself did not march the Long March but was carried on a litter by his men. Nevertheless, Mao uses the Long March as the foundation stone of his heroic image. The Long March is our manifesto. It has proclaimed to the world that the Red Army is an army of heroes and to the people that it is their only road to liberation. 1948, the tide is turning in Mao's favor in China's brutal civil war. October, Liaoning province, northeast China, a major industrial area and a strategic fulcrum between China, Korea, Japan and the Soviet Union. Liaoning is at the heart of a massive military campaign that will determine the future of the country. After months of ferocious fighting in Chancheng and Shenyang, Chiang Kai-shek's army and the city's civilian populations are totally surrounded. Mao, now in his mid-fifties, issues the chilling order, turn them into cities of death. His military commander in the campaign, 
is Lin Biao, Mao's most trusted general. Here on the right, shot by a combat cameraman in this recently unearthed 35mm colour film, he reports back to Mao on the success of the order. The blockade has produced remarkable results and has caused great famine. The civilians are living on leaves and grass. Many have died. On the front line, we have placed sentry every 50 meters, plus barbed wires and ditches. Any who got out were forced to return. Some knelt in front of our men, begging to be allowed to go. Some put their babies down in front of our troops and turned back. Some hanged themselves there and then. A communist PLA veteran is witness to the suffering. When we saw so many people dying of hunger, we weren't shocked. We had been in and out of piles of corpses, and our hearts had been hardened. We were unmoved. But when we moved into the city and saw what it was like, we were devastated. Many of us wept. A lot of us said, we are supposed to be fighting for the poor? Aren't these the bodies of poor people? Chiang Kai-shek's army is destroyed, suffering over 400,000 dead. At least the same number of civilians die in Changchun alone. In 1948, China's civil war has reached a critical stage. Mao knows that to win, he must rely on deserters from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist army. He orders his field commanders to use loud hailers to offer food, clothing, and a place in the ranks of the People's Liberation Army if they desert the nationalist cause. He also orders that existing nationalist POWs are offered the same deal. His commanders, especially his political commissar, Deng Xiaoping, and his commander-in-chief, Marshal Liu Boxiang, are horrified by the potential risks. But Mao responds in the bluntest of terms. If you do not do as I ask, we cannot sustain our attacks and victory will slip away. Carry out your orders. Late December 1948, Kalgan, now known as Jiangjiakou, Hebei province, northwest of Beijing. The PLA storms the city. Kalgan is occupied on December 24th. A series of battles across several provinces is underway, involving over 7 million men including over five million armed peasants fighting for the PLA. Mao's risky tactic of offering enemy soldiers the opportunity to change sides begins to work. Many of Chiang Kai-shek's men, including some of his senior commanders, begin to surrender. With Mao skulking out of the limelight, General Lin Biao and his fellow officers look on as the PLA makes its triumphant march into Beijing on January 22nd, 1949. From behind the scenes, Mao soon begins to assert the supreme authority of the state and introduces strict censorship laws. By late March 1949, fighting has broken out in Taiyuan in Shanxi province. city falls to the PLA on March 24th. On April 23rd, Nanjing falls. Chiang Kai-shek's government flees south to Guangzhou. 
as the PLA storms Chang's headquarters. rage all over China as Mao's PLA comes close to total victory. Shanghai falls. The PLA is welcomed into the city as conquering heroes. Joey Min watches as the huge parade passes her home. We were so excited. Everyone was celebrating. There weren't too many communists in my district, but they had promised an end to the corruption and the violence in the city, and everyone wanted that. Unfortunately, at that time, we had no idea what would come with it. Although it will take several months for the PLA to occupy all the regions of China, the civil war is effectively over. Chiang Kai-shek escapes to the offshore island of Formosa, where he establishes the new Republic of China, now better known as Taiwan. Mao and his Communist Party are the new masters of mainland China and its 550 million people. October 1st, 1949. Mao Zedong arrives in Tiananmen Square in Beijing to declare the formation of the People's Republic of China. He is already surrounded by several layers of tight security a reflection of his paranoia about his personal safety. Madame Lo Fu, a friend of many years, goes to see him and his wife, Jan Qing, on the eve of the declaration. He was in high spirits. When I asked about his health, Jiang Qing said he was all right, except he would tremble when he saw strangers. At first, I didn't understand, and I said, but he looks all right today. The Mao interrupted with a smile. But you are an old friend, not a stranger. When Mao appears at the Tiananmen Gate of the Forbidden City, it is his first appearance in front of a large crowd. This unique color film with original sound has only recently been found in the archives. As Mao declares the founding of the People's Republic of China, an ecstatic crowd, over 100,000 strong, roars its approval. A female witness to the scene describes how she felt. I was carried away by the indescribable emotion. I saw the figures of so many gallant women among the hundreds of thousands of peasants, workers and soldiers. Joyfully, with thumping hearts, they stood before Chairman Mao for his inspection. Was this not truly the symbol of the Chinese people? Do not the waves of red flags, like the sea, symbolize new China's brilliant future? As Mao's People's Liberation Army wins more and more territory in China, he orders senior Communist Party officials into the newly conquered areas to begin the ideological cleansing of his people. His favorite enforcer is Kang Sheng, whose tactics are notoriously ruthless. Mao asks him to set a benchmark for others to follow 
in how to impose his communist ideology. Mao has isolated China from the world as he makes it undergo a brutal revolution. Mao's son, An Ying, is placed under Kang Sheng's tutelage so that he can understand how revolutionary change has to happen. An Ying is 27 years old and a Second World War veteran, having fought for the Soviet Red Army on the Eastern Front against Nazi Germany. He keeps a secret diary. Denunciations began. All the masses were told to raise the weapons and shout over and over again, kill, kill, kill. The rally ended with several people beaten to death. Some of the activists recruited were thugs and drags, former puppets of the Japanese invaders. A young party official witnesses many of these denunciations. Four people were hanging from a rope by their wrists, watched by every man, woman and child in the village. One of them was a female landlord. In fact, she hadn't got much land. They asked her where she had hidden the grain. I knew she didn't have any grain, but they insisted and beat her. Her blouse was ripped off. She had just had a baby and her milk was dripping. The baby was crying and crawling on the ground, trying to lick up the milk. People lowered their heads and couldn't bear to look, but were forced to watch. If they refused, they would also be punished. Kang Shen sets fearsome guidelines for the future. There must be abuse. Educate the peasants to show no mercy. There will be death. But let's not be afraid of death. Mao is unyielding in his determination to cleanse China of its past. The landlords, rich peasants, bourgeoisie, intellectuals. These are not easily abolished. That is why in Hunan alone, 100,000 people were challenged. 10,000 were arrested, 1,000 executed. The landlords will become peasants. The capitalists will be workers. The bourgeoisie can enter the communes, but they must be made to wear their bourgeois hats so that the people can see them. It is the beginning of a reign of terror that will last for many years in Mao's new China. This remarkable 16 mm color film is shot by US military intelligence officer Stanley Dara in post-war China. Posing as left-wing sympathizers from their base in London, he travels through China with his wife, Susan, where Dara captures these unique images in secret. The material later becomes part of the classified CIA collection. It has only recently been declassified and released into the US National Archives in Washington. As Mao consolidates his power in Beijing, he bases his dream of transforming China on the Soviet model of enforced collectivization and state ownership. But typically, he is impatient. According to the Soviet model, social classes were abolished after 16 years. We must be more ambitious than that. We must begin a campaign of ruthless struggle and merciless blows. We must move to communist ownership in the countryside and in the factories. That is the public ownership of all eating, clothing and housing. The Soviet Union still encourages the construction of houses by private individuals. We will eliminate private housing in the future. A 
Aware that China is predominantly an impoverished agrarian society, Mao knows that he has to transform its industrial output from a series of cottage industries into large-scale production. We should learn from the Soviet Union. Who helped us with munitions, tanks and artillery? They are a socialist country. We are socialists. They are socialists. Let us learn from them. Heavy industry will take precedence. It will take three, five-year plans to increase our steel production from 900,000 tons to over 20 million tons. Mao's short-term impatience and ruthlessness sit beside a long-term vision for the future. We must start from scratch. Our ancestors left us nothing but imperialism, feudalism, and Chiang Kai-shek. Now this land is ours. Together with everybody, together with the youth, let's devote decades to working on this land. If the first half of this century is for revolution, then the second half is for construction. We must educate the youth about why they have to work hard and start from scratch. for China's future is draconian. He begins a series of five-year plans during the 1950s, which are designed to transform the country along strictly socialist lines, an ideology that becomes known as Maoism. Using slogans like, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, he encourages China's peasants to engage in a relentless class struggle against the country's landlords, merchants, and middle classes. In short, he encourages China to go to war with its past and anyone associated with it. Some positive things are achieved, like the eradication of drug trafficking, organized crime and prostitution, and corrupt foreign investment. But on the whole, the results are catastrophic. He declares, Many places don't dare to kill counter-revolutionaries on a grand scale. That must change. The purge of counter-revolutionaries is remorseless. Wang Li Shu is a young woman in Langzhong County, Sichuan, southwest China. Physical torture was used. People would be whipped. The cadres would beat people up, hitting them with stakes and rocks. Some were so badly injured, they would spit blood. Ma readily admits to mass killings in the early years of his rule. In 1950, 51, 52, in those three years, we killed 700,000. But if they had not been killed, the people would not have been able to raise their heads. The people demanded the killing in order to liberate the productive forces from the evil despots the backbone elements of the counter-revolutionaries. Most experts of China's modern history suggest that the true figure for deaths at this time was many millions. China is being transformed by a huge program of collectivization. As a result, within a few years, with no incentive to work the land, food shortages become acute 
in China's more remote regions. It is a portent of the horrors to come. Impatient at the speed of change towards communism, Mao launches a great leap forward in 1958 to quicken the process. It only makes matters worse. Zhu Erge lives in a small village in Jiangyang County, Sichuan. Our pots and pans were taken away as we were only allowed to eat in the collective canteen. Everything was collectivized. We had nothing left in the inn. Millions flee the countryside and travel to the cities. We watched the new rice shoots die. There was nothing we could do. The cadres were real tyrants. They went around houses, smashing up everything without hesitation. Our wardrobes and beds were broken into pieces and burned as fuel. They eventually pulled down the walls of our mud house to use as fertilizer. 19-year-old Huang Manyi lives in Dingyuan County, Anhui Province, central eastern China. I was so frightened in those days. My teacher called the Great Leap Forward a failure. He was sent to labor camp for eight years. My uncle's wife got caught eating wheat in the field. She was denounced and tortured there and then. It was brutal, too brutal for me to talk about. They beat her until she died of her injuries. My eldest aunt died in a similar way. It was a snowy day. She was crawling along the road looking for something to eat. She started grazing on raw wheat. After she was discovered, a large group of people was sent out to catch her. She was cold, hungry, and badly traumatized. She died soon after. A huge famine results from the imposition of the Great Leap Forward, during which it is estimated that between 20 million and 40 million people died. The failure of the Great Leap Forward weakens Mao's position as supreme leader, and he's challenged by Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi. Mao's response is a cultural revolution, which he launches in 1966 to reignite class struggle and purge China of revisionists like Deng and Liu. China sinks into an abyss of chaos and death, even worse than before. He unleashes millions of young Red Guards who are driven on by the diktats of Mao's Little Red Book, which demands that all revisionists be purged. The Red Guards roam far and wide, committing acts of murder and brutality. The country almost ceases to function amidst the terror. A 32-year-old bus conductor describes what it is like to become a victim of the repression of the Cultural Revolution at the hands of its notorious Red Guards. The Red Guards turned everything upside down. I saw a person beaten to death on Fifth Street with my own eyes. A mass political debate was going on among the workers. The situation turned into a real war. The young man chooses the wrong side in a dispute between rival factions of workers. I was arrested by the Public Securities Bureau in 1970. I was tortured ferociously. They tied my hands behind my back and pushed them up almost to my ears. I could almost hear the sound of my muscles tearing apart and my blood vessels popping. It was worse than having my head chopped off. I didn't recover for four months. He survives the brutality of his torture but is imprisoned for the next 22 years. Most victims of the Red Guards do not survive. Between one million and three million people 
die during the purges of the Cultural Revolution, as Mao reasserts his iron grip on China. By the early 1960s, Mao Zedong's ruthlessness towards friend and foe alike has made him China's supreme leader, with just as much power as the country's ancient emperors. Li Jiaxue had been appointed as Mao's personal physician in 1954. He spends more time with China's leader than anybody else. By the 60s, Mao has been completely seduced by the temptations of absolute power. Li is shocked by Mao's many personal peculiarities. Mao never brushed his teeth. Like many peasants from southern China, he used tea to rinse out his mouth when he woke, eating the leaves after drinking the water. As the years went by, his teeth became blackened and began falling out. Fortunately, his lips covered those that remained. Even when he talked or smiled, few people noticed. Mao's fondness for an endless supply of young women, chosen for him wherever he goes, and his refusal to bathe disgust Li. I was nauseated. Mao's sexual indulgences, his sullying of so many naive and innocent young women, were almost more than I could bear. Mao becomes a carrier of venereal disease that refuses Li's suggested treatment and his plea for him to improve his personal hygiene, saying, I wash myself in the bodies of my young women. But it is Mao's political hypocrisy that most disappoints Li. He has countless palaces built, each with an enormous swimming pool. The railway network is closed down when he travels on his luxury train, and all planes are grounded when he's in the air. I had grown to hate the hypocrisy around me, the touting of lofty communist principles while living a life of luxury as the masses toiled, suffered and died. My hopes and dreams and my visions of Mao and of his new and good society were shattered. The people were nothing more than a vast multitude of faceless, helpless slaves. I was disgusted. New China had become corrupt. February 1972, US President Richard Nixon travels to China to meet Chairman Mao. China's close relationship with the Soviet Union has broken down. Border clashes in 1969 almost led to an all-out war between them. Nixon knows that the axis of world affairs is beginning to shift towards the east. He realizes that a new superpower is emerging and recognizes that a dialogue with China is vital to ending America's protracted war in Vietnam and to release the tension in Soviet-US relations. It is a groundbreaking visit that has taken many months to negotiate. Nixon's host, Joy Lai, is a Communist Party veteran and organizer of the Long March. He is now China's Prime Minister. Mao stays in the background, and when he does meet Nixon, he refuses to let cameras loaded with color film record the famous encounter. Only a few color stills, shot by a local Beijing photographer, have survived. Nixon calls the visit the week that changed the world. With his new relationship in place, Nixon has outmaneuvered the Soviets. A few months later, he travels to Moscow to meet Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. There, they sign the first major agreement to limit the proliferation of nuclear weapons, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty.
He speaks directly to the Russian people about peace. Dobrovetsky. History tells us that great nations have often been dragged into war without intending it by conflicts between smaller nations. He makes a pointed reference to the Soviet Union's relationship with Mao Zedong's China. Our goal should be to discourage aggression in other parts of the world, and particularly among those smaller nations that look to us for leadership and example. With great power goes great responsibility. It is the beginning of the end of the Cold War and the emergence of a new world order with China as a major player. Mao's ruthless single-mindedness has brought his people to the forefront of world affairs. China, the sleeping giant of history, has at long last woken from its slumber. But Mao is now an old man and surrounded by the intrigues of ambitious rivals hoping to succeed him. Mao's paranoia, reliance on sleeping pills, poor high-fat diet and heavy smoking begin to take their toll on his health. He suffers three major heart attacks in 1976 and dies on September 9th at the age of 82. Amid scenes of remarkable anguish, the great helmsman lies in state in the great hall of the people. Although he was purged twice during the brutality of the Cultural Revolution, Mao's old ally, Deng Xiaoping, survives the turmoil after Mao's death, re-emerges as China's leader, and gradually guides it to a more open society and dramatic economic growth. It takes many years for China to recover from the excesses of the callous authoritarian rule of Mao Zedong. But by Deng's death in 1997, China's economic miracle is a reality. Many in China still believe that the changes Mao forced on the country were a necessary evil that allowed the Chinese people to shed their ancient past and find their exciting future. But in doing so, he made many millions of them pay the ultimate price. <laughs> 